Again, to start, I'm very excited to have everyone here tonight for a, another uh, Chicago Booth virtual event hosted by the Chicago Alumni Club here in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. And I'm excited that uh, it's not only the Swiss people attending, but are people from all over the world. That's pretty exciting. Um, before I will introduce tonight's um, guest speaker and host and moderator, and star guest, uh, let me quickly uh, give you a view from uh, the alumni club here in, in Zurich. I'm sure you all missed our letters and events and all that kind of stuff, and you all surely know why. Uh, at some point, after getting some feedback by a lot of alumni, we decided to actually hold off for a while and not do a series of virtual events because everybody got a little sick of uh, zooming in and zooming out. So we decided to wait till the whole thing is over, uh, which, yeah. Nobody knows exactly why, but I can assure you that we have a series of very nice events um, planned for the upcoming <clears throat> Corona COVID free, restriction free time in the summer. Um, we will surely uh, and very uh, soon update you on when will happen what, as soon as we can somehow um, see where things are going. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm glad if things like this tonight are happening and uh, Roger uh, imposed himself on the club to actually uh, bring in his deeply um, interesting knowledge. He has made a successful career as a banker, <coughs> who would guess that, uh, coming from Switzerland. But no, he has not done that only in Switzerland, but he has spent uh, many times, many years in, in Asia. And he draws from experiences and leadership experiences, not only in the Swiss culture, but also globally and in particular uh, from Asia. He then uh, founded a consulting firm and has been consulting with uh, senior executives um, since then. And I'm sure he tells you more about that in particular uh, and how to deal with the crisis. And I'm very excited, Roger, that you do this. Uh, thanks a lot for, um, for taking your time and uh, we're all very very excited uh, to have to spend this hour with you over to you thank you oliver and uh, thanks everyone uh, for having me um yeah my name is roger goetz as uh, oliver has just introduced uh, i did my ex mba in uh, singapore back in 2008 um, with the, the, the cohort, what was it, AXP9, I think. Um, and I also spent, uh, and Oliver mentioned it as well, I spent half of my professional career in Asia, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, working for Credit Suisse and HSBC. Um, and also back in, in 2007, I co-founded a boutique uh, HR consulting company focusing on uh, leadership development uh, questions for multinationals, for um, small and mid-sized companies. And when we returned back to Switzerland two and a half years ago, um, I decided to join another boutique in the same field, uh, but uh, predominantly focusing on Switzerland and uh, larger Europe. The company is called Leader Solutions, um, and uh, we basically advise uh, also small and mid-sized companies, but also occasionally MNCs on different areas of their human capital um, topics especially on uh, leadership development questions, but also executive search and uh, assessment centers. So when Penka and uh, Jenny approached me end of last year with the thought of doing this, this leadership uh, talk today, uh, I had mixed feelings, quite frankly. On one hand, I was totally excited because I, I truly believe that, that leadership, especially in these times, is of utmost uh, crucial, essential for many organizations. Um, on the other hand, I'm obviously passionate about the topic. Um, on the other hand, um, as, as Oliver just mentioned, I mean, we're all now sitting at home, Zooming the whole day, and what we definitely don't need is another hour of Zoom over lunch or in the evening, and the guy sitting there and telling us uh, what he thinks about leadership. So that, that was a bit the cautious part. So uh, the format tonight, 
uh, it should really be a highly interactive one because a uh, I don't want to just sit here and tell you what I know and believe is right about leadership because I don't think there is that right leadership um, and B um, I think it also wouldn't be that interesting by the way and B I don't I don't think we would learn that much because it will be one view and the essential part is of the exchanging views you all have made experience over the last years months what works, what doesn't work, what works for you, and what maybe works for others. And I think this is what most of us will take back out of this session. Um, so we really decided to, uh, to do it as interactive as possible. And depending on the, also the platform, obviously Zoom has its limits in terms of interactivity, but let, let's try to make the most out of it. So the structure will be that I will kick off with some of my observations uh, advising organizations in the course of the last 12, 15 months um, in terms of leadership, what I've seen works well and maybe some stuff that works less well, takes about 10, 15 minutes uh, maybe. And then we'll, uh, we'll do the first round of breakout sessions. Um, I will give in some one or two questions that you can toss around and exchange views. But these breakout sessions obviously also have a social element. It allows you to catch up with others again and, uh, and be to also bring in your ideas and share um, again what has worked for you. And then we go back uh, after roughly 10 minutes. We do a debrief. We collect out of each group what have been the essence, the summary, before then going another 10 minutes in different breakout rooms to then dwell a bit on what has been discussed in the first one, what have we heard, and etc. before um, at the end summarizing the key uh, learnings, the key observations, and that will bring us after, let's say, 50, 55 minutes uh, to an end so that we can stop in time. So that, that's roughly the structure. Without further ado, I will then start with my um, my thoughts uh, will share the screen if hopefully it works. Um, let's see where we've got it. So, so now you should see all my screen. Um, yeah, obviously what we want to see and you have had the pre-reading, some in the typical Chicago Boo style, the regression anal analysis in the US about finding out uh, where Leadership has a significant impact uh, on an organization where it can only be attributed to luck or coincidence. And the free reading obviously was there to bring you in the right mindset. So let me start with uh, a couple of uh, definitions. So on leadership, you obviously find thousands of definitions. I've picked three of them. Um, but I want to quickly focus on the, the right hand side of the of the screen, more looking at uh, at crisis. And what I like about this definition, it it defines three level of crisis. So the level one crisis is defined by having known problems and known solutions. For example, the example is used here on eth unethical behavior. Level two crisis, we have known problems but we have unknown solutions. So for example, a serious damage to the company's reputation. So we know what has caused the, the, the serious damage to the reputation, but we are not sure yet what will be the solutions to deal with that. And level three crisis is defined by having complex and unknown problems and unknown solutions. So typically a war, or pandemics that we are facing right now is characterized by, by this uh, setting. If you think about what we, what we have seen the last couple of months, it's really, we don't know yet enough about the whole COVID thing. And because we don't know so much, we also not clear what is working, what is not. So we, we see a lot of trial and error out there trying to find the best way of dealing with the situation. So keep that in mind when we go forward, we're looking at a level three crisis. But on the brighter side of things, let's go with what uh, Sir Vincent Churchill has said about crisis. So let's look at what opportunities crisis um, give us as well. And for that, I would like to take you to previous crisis. 
for for those in Asia, uh, they still can very much remember SARS, very actually very similar to COVID. Um, back in uh, 2002, almost 20 years ago. But interestingly, what you see on the right hand side, what has emerged out of this crisis is actually a new business model. It's, it's innovation, because what has taken off at that time is the whole e-commerce um, boom. You have Alibaba and the other ones out there in Asia who have significantly grown during the time where people couldn't get out of the house. So now looking at more recent crises like the, the great financial crisis, um, Ubers and Airbnb and others that are focusing on sharing economy, using technology um, to basically uh, as a marketplace for underutilized assets has boomed during the time of the great financial crisis and afterwards. And last but not least, the crisis that we found ourselves in before the pandemic hit and will definitely outlast the pandemic as well, which is the climate crisis. And also out of the climate crisis, you see a lot of innovation coming out. You see obviously the whole solar and renewable energy topic, electric cars or environmental friendly food such as plant-based meat substitutes and that list could go on. So you see, on one hand, you are crisis. On the other hand, you have huge opportunity coming out of it. So what, what aspects of leadership um, is relevant looking at this? Interestingly, um, mid of last year, so during the pandemic, uh, McKinsey has conducted quite a large study why innovation in a crisis is more critical than ever. They surveyed about 200 organizations across industries. And what they found is that more than 90% of the executives believe that COVID-19 fundamentally will change the business the way they do over the next couple of years. More than 75% believe that there are big opportunities for growth. But interestingly, less than 30% believe they have what is needed to capture these opportunities. These can be human resources, financial resources, or the whole kind. And this stands for against the, the, the known part that what, what is here in the middle, what is known from previous crises is that companies that invest in innovation during the crisis delivered superior growth and performance post-crisis. So we know that actually while many of the companies actually focus uh, on preserving their current business model, trying to maintain the cash flow and securing the cash flow, only very few take the opportunity to, to actually invest during the crisis in innovation. And that brings me to, to the core leadership skill during a crisis is to actually promote and enable innovation and creative problem solving. You remember a level three crisis is characterized by unknown complex problems and unknown solutions. And what do you need to deal with such a situation? You actually need the most possible creative ideas that you can gather in order to find ultimately the right solutions. So leadership in a crisis is to promote and enable innovation. There are two core ingredients to foster an environment that enables innovation and development of creative ideas to complex problems. There are these two factors, psychological safety and sincere care. Psychological safety is defined by an absence of interpersonal fear, actually that people dare to speak up their mind freely. And this, most of you know this study from Google, Aristotle, they have clearly shown that psychological fact, uh, safety is the key factor for team creativity and productivity, especially, especially for complex problems with unknown solutions. Here we go again, level three crisis characterized complex problems, unknown solutions. Psychological safety creates the environment that allows actually to have team creativity and productivity to deal with these kind of situations. Second point is sincere care. People actually feel that the organization, the leadership team truly cares 
for their well-being. It's not just a lip service, it's not just a mission statement, but they actually get a sense of belonging that we are in this together. If leaders actually show this sincere care, only then the sense of purpose and shared vision can emerge. And shared vision and shared sense of purpose is the strongest predictor of organizational leadership effectiveness, engagement, and product innovation. And here again, product innovation comes when we have a shared vision and a shared sense of purpose. And sincere care is one of the leadership skill or prerequisite that people actually start engaging cognitively with the problem at hand. So these two core ingredients actually foster an environment that enables innovation and the innovation on the other hand is absolutely critical during the times of crisis. So actually we've put that in a framework. Um, the framework is called Leadership 5.0. Leadership 4.0 is actually about the impact of digitization on leadership and Leadership 5.0 actually has at the, at the fundamental the, the, the true key enabler is that I, as a leader, I know my purpose as a leader. That comes out of self-management, self-reflection. And only if I know what's my purpose as a leader, I have the necessary capacity and composure to actually then allow people around me to come up with their ideas, to actually be a moderator, with high EQ and create an environment characterized by psychological safety and sincere care. This again, then will allow me to capture the diversity and to transform the diversity into creativity. So it's about recognizing and developing. Not every creativity obviously helps in a certain situation, but it's me, a leader, who needs to be able to transform the right diversity into creativity. And then it's still the normal leadership principle. It's about deciding and managing which ones we're taking, which targets do we need to fulfill. And on top, we have the agile leadership. It's a constant, especially now, it's a constant adjusting and leading from the top. So this pyramid clearly shows as a leader, it starts fundamentally, how, know do I, how good do I know myself? How clear am I about my purpose as a leader? And only this will allow me in the future to deal with the heterogeneous environment that allows me to create the innovation and, uh, and the creativity. Good news about this is self and self-reflection kind of gives us a, a starting point to work with. Each of us can work on that allows us as an organization to work with leaders in the organization because the key is with the individual leaders is with the group of leaders. So that's the essence about the, the, the leadership 5.0. So I think I've already used up my time. Um, these were my thoughts a bit around leadership. It's really about fostering an environment that allows innovation and creativity and crucial leadership principles are psychological safety and sincere care. Now I'm obviously very curious to hear your thoughts, your observations, and as agreed, here are some questions that you can uh, discuss in your breakout rooms. First is, what is your experience as a, uh, of leadership in the recent months? It will be very interesting to also hear from different geographies, different industries. Do we see significant difference on that? Think of good leadership experience. What were some of the key leadership principles? And uh, ultimately, obviously going back to the title, do you believe it's, it's more skill or do you think it's ultimately also a bit coincidence and luck? Jenny, can I give you the administration? Yes, I will and push everybody out into their group rooms. So please, uh, somebody from each group then do the debrief when we come back. I'm gonna give you in total, uh, 12 minutes. Uh, enjoy. Here you go, Roger. You should all have them to their roots.
Timing wise, we're good, Jenny, right? If you want to join the room, feel free to. You don't have to. Okay. Sorry, you're on mute. I think I'll wait as we discussed before and I will capture the, sure. the outcomes from the rooms. Sounds good. So Raja, I find your psychological safety notion very interesting, actually. You know, how do you create that in a team and how do you constantly reaffirm that also as teams change, as the tasks change, as the challenges change? And also how do you do this virtually, especially when you might not have met everyone in your team? It's quite interesting. Um, yes, indeed, and it actually goes a bit back on that pyramid that I shown. Um, it has a lot to do with that, that self-awareness as well, because once you start challenging yourself in terms of your mental model that, that you have acquired over the years, in terms of, for example, how, how you deal with, um, creative ideas, for example, that are brought up to you, not just verbally, you can be very supportive and non-verbally very disupportive in terms of rolling the eyes or just making some kind and that also happens virtually. And these are small nuances that very fast creates a certain culture. Um, these kind of mental models and many of the leadership teams actually display once you start working with them a very strong mental model mm -hmm. with kind of stereotypes, you know, what's good and what is not good and, and all these things. And, uh, and they are not aware of the impact that these kind of uh, sometimes un unconscious behavior actually impose on people's, uh, yeah, to dare to actually come up to you and think and say, hey, what do you think about this or that? Right. Or others actually start then um, imitating what they observe from leadership because, because, as you said, you know, leadership defines the culture. And ultimately, we start on a low or middle management level behaving the same way as we see with leaders. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's, that, that's where a lot actually is possible to create the supportive environment to create. And, and another, another interesting element is, is the whole high performance team. You know, it's also a big topic. And mm -hmm. high performance team actually builds on psychological safety. Yeah, exactly. It's without judgment, you know, on yeah. all this. And, uh, and 
again, similar to what I said about pyramid, the good thing is, Benko, that we, or each leader can do a lot of work, him or herself, already on this. Because once you start asking yourself, in many instances in life, is how open you approach a new situation. Or, and I mean, children are always the best example. In my, if, yeah. if you have kids and in the first couple of years, they just don't judge. They yeah. want to play with everyone and all this. And then at some point at like seven or eight, they get the notions from previous experience. Oh, this one I like better than that, etc. And then they start already judging. And as soon as you start judging with pre-notion, it's very hard to have an equalization in, in, in that culture. So... Mm -hmm. It's basically unwinding what you have learned uh, over the course of your adult life. You, plus, yes, all that. Plus, you always have to be conscious as a leader of everything, as you said, you do, you say, how you are being perceived. So it's a huge self-awareness exercise, I think. Yes. Constantly. Yes. Yeah. And there are interesting exercises that you actually can expose yourself to situations that based on your judgment, based on your conditioning, you wouldn't usually go into. <laughs> and it's a very interesting experience you can do for yourself. That can be also in social group, private gathering, whatever. If you force yourself to join groups that you would rather not. And then at the beginning, go through pretending. At the beginning, you try to make a friendly face, talk to someone while you even think, oh no, not this one again, and all this. And then you will see over the course of the time as it becomes more natural. And that actually is, is equalizing some of the, of the conditioning that had to put you on the other, hand, on the other side. So, yeah. It's, it's a very interesting work that you can actually engage with leaders in. So you have to unlearn some of your... Exactly. Yeah, that's the exactly. point. Yeah. And okay. That's so hard, especially at a certain age, and especially if it has proven you're right. You know, most of these leaders you work with have kind of been successful. But you see yeah. so often, you know, the culture and companies, people actually do from eight to five work as ordered, and then they walk out and they become entrepreneurs. In their mm -hmm. spare time, they do things with skills you've never seen during the workplace. And mm -hmm. you wonder, what does it need to capture some of that creativity? Yeah. And I think many organizations just lose out on so much potential. Yeah, we're going currently through an exercise in our department. So this is alumni relations and fundraising on how to foster innovation and creativity. Yeah. So that we, you know, are all more open for new ideas. We encourage each other. We fail forward. We give creative and constructive feedback instead of judging. So it's, it's hard. You have to work very hard at it because, as you said, you know, you have learned a lot and it's hard to unlearn. It's, it's massive. It's, yeah. It's, it's it's like you said, it's like a constant looking in the mirror. Yeah. And, uh, and you can't, and you know, the funny thing is you can't go to a seminar or leadership course and you learn it there. It's just because mm -hmm. at the bottom, the fundamental, it's you. Exactly. And, and, and so many leaders have delegated for years, you know, they send their middle management, go and take this course. And then they come back with all the tools and they still fail. Mm -hmm. Because, and that's one thing, you know, that may, I get challenged often on Leadership 5.0. It sounds like a progression in technology and progression in whatnot. I said, actually, it's going back to the fundamentals again. It's as yeah. simple as look at yourself. You know how many leaders are absorbed with their own agenda, with their oh, own yeah. anxieties, with their own fears and everything. They don't have the capacity to deal with anything of what you just said. Mm -hmm. You know, their staff bring them ideas, creative thoughts, but if you're absorbed with yourself, you're not hearing them. Yeah, exactly. It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I really do find it fascinating. But it's one aspect of leadership, but I wanted to take this out because it's usually not that one that, that comes to people's mind if they think of leadership in a crisis. Yeah. 
a fellow Booth alumna who is currently based in India, Ruchira, she just published her book on leadership, uh, a leader leading as a coach. We'll send you the link. Um, she's apparently um, has a very relatively unique view on uh, leadership. And Sharon Sandberg wrote the wrote a piece in her book and her lean in circles have reached out. So she must be striking a, a chord there. I haven't read the book mm -hmm. yet, but it sounds like an interesting angle as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. A leader can be many different things. And as you said, you know, there's a million definitions of what a leader is or leadership. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Even at Booth, I think different professors teach it in different ways, right? We have Harry Davis, we have Linda Ginzel. Harry talks a lot about stage um, personas. Yeah. Changing with the, depending on the situation. Sometimes you're the, the main act, sometimes you're the supporting actor and so forth. It's also interesting. Yeah, absolutely. But, but also there, you know, to have the variety in your behavior depending on the circumstances yeah. falls back on do you believe you have what is necessary? And, and do you know, again, what's my purpose as a leader? You know, can I take the back seat if necessary? Can I let others who are more skilled on what is required right now to give the front seat? And my observation is always those who are somewhere self-assured and they are in tune with themselves, they have much less difficulty stepping back as well. Mm -hmm. While others just believe, hey, I'm the leader, I need to be up there. And you're like, yeah, but you don't have the skill that is needed. Yeah, anyway, I'm the leader. Oh, okay. <laughs> but people will start to return into the main room now. So they have 30 seconds. Okay, great. Thanks, Tim. This was recorded, I think. It would be on. That's true. <laughs> But it was we very can cut that piece out. <laughs> Roger, I must compliment you. You speak so well. Thanks, Costa. <laughs> it's brilliant. That's what I learned, you know, in our uh, cohort. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, absolutely wonderful listening to you. I hope it also makes sense of it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I love what you say. It's brilliant. Um, Jenny, will you make a roll call? or Because I don't know who has been in which group and all this. Uh, I don't know who's been in each group. Too, so maybe Perfect. we can call on them. Group one, group two. Maybe okay. there will be a few of them. Or somebody who wants to speak up from their group who had good insights, we'd be happy to hear from you. Come live on camera and we can see you. Jenny, can I talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go same. Hi, I'm not sure what group, group number we were, but I was talking to Hans. And uh, my specialty, my name is Dana Nazer from Cities Forum. I'm based in the UK, in Southampton specifically. And uh, I uh, shared with Hans uh, my experience as a, my specialty is in uh, smart mobility and smart cities. So as you know, that transportation has a major effect on um, basically the climate change. So in a, in a negative way, right? So if anything, the COVID-19 has been a fantastic opportunity for decision maker in government to rethink about the whole mobility thing. Uh, it was in a way very positive because people, as they were not, supposed to use, I mean, you know, that TFL, I mean, they're in real crisis now and the national rail because people were not using public transport at, at, as they used to. So um, then people were moving towers. There was a big shift of uh, traveler behavior to use the cycle or walk or scooters. Now we have in Southampton a uh, trial with Voy, which is a Swedish company for electric scooters. So they're moving towards micro mobility, active transport. Um, but then again, there is this risk if we don't learn after COVID. And if we kind of, uh, so you have basically, as I explained to Hans, the users of the public transport who move to either cars or 
to micro mobility, which is scooters, bicycle walking. Um, and then after COVID, what will happen uh, if the government doesn't enforce not using the cars because this is affecting the climate change? So there is a great opportunity and it is in the hand of the government what they want to do. A UK government. So I can only speak for the UK government. So very interesting. Interesting would be for me now to understand what kind of leadership principle do you believe will be necessary to actually to make it more sustainable? Because that, that's the ultimate question, you know, to, to basically have COVID help in your cause, that's great, but then to make it sustainable. So what's your thought quickly on that one? So, as I said, it's, uh, there is a great opportunity, um, but then again, it's, uh, it's again how people will, what will people do and how would they behave? Uh, after COVID, that is the question. So, as I said, during COVID, the move was positive towards less use of personal vehicle. Uh, let's say uh, loss for the public transport, unfortunately, but a great opportunity to help with the climate change. But after COVID, uh, it's not, I would say it's not clear. I mean, there is also, I, I forgot to mention electric vehicle push, also, there's pushing towards electric vehicles. So it, there's a great opportunity for all the innovation and technology in transport that is taking place and great shift because of the effect and uh, the situation that we are in. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Other, other takeaways from the group? Uh, if I go, I was group six, we had four members and my team, please join in if I miss out something. Uh, on, on good leadership experience, we thought that any leader who makes you feel valued, uh, that's very important. Second, we thought leaders who articulate the vision and, and are able to give that sense of purpose to their team, uh, that's a good experience. Uh, so those are the two points we thought on good leadership experience. Is leadership a skill or a luck? Uh, we think it's a skill primarily. However, uh, there was a point made that in cyclical industries, it could at times become luck. Uh, because uh, there was one person who worked in the oil and gas industry and he said when the oil price goes up, everybody is jumping on the roof. And when but last year, I think we had negative <laughs> price. Then they're all scared. Do we have our jobs? Don't we, or, or do we lose our jobs, etc.? So pr primarily, we were the group was leaning more towards leadership is a skill. It can be learned because people can t value individuals. People can articulate visions. People can communicate well. So all of that would be a skill which can be developed. Uh, and the bit of luck comes if it's a cyclical industry and there's a fear of uh, people losing their jobs. And anybody else wants to join in from my team, please feel free. That was, room, uh, that was uh, uh, group six. Thank you. No, thank you, Partish. I think you summarized very well uh, from the four PAs from our side. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks a lot, Partish. Incidentally, incidentally hmm? all of us, the first two alphabets of all our, our group members' names started with PA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other yeah. key takeaways? I'd like to hear from group three. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, we were three people um, Chantal Schumacher, Hannes Weibel, and myself. Uh, with respect to the first question, uh, we highlighted that it is important to show trust. Um, Emotional quality more important than ever since informational, uh, like info informal streams of information such as water cooler conversation uh, are very restricted and limited. Uh, as such, as a leader, you need to explain the purpose of what you are doing, why you are doing it. Um, still uh, having social interaction take place, meetings without agenda. Uh, at the same time, flexibility is very important. Um, however, there needs to be an agreement within the team um, about working hours that make sense. Um, also looking at 
uh, restrictions like family restrictions, family times for team members. Uh, you can't have a 24 by 7 agenda. So there needs to be an agreement in place um, how the working group is um, operating. Um, with respect to uh, leadership uh, principles or skills, um, obviously it's a skill, but there is also luck. Uh, luck uh, mostly in, the t in terms of um, being at the right point in time, at the right place, um, because uh, we highlighted at the group that we have seen very good leaders disappear uh, for unknown reasons. And um, at the same time, um, a leader always needs to consider that people can uh, look up facts. You know, in, in former times, leadership has um, very much the connotation of authority. In today's time, where, where a lot of information is accessible from everywhere, um, the, the group can access information, the group can make up their own mind. As such, um, it, a leader uh, needs to also make sure he's able to listen well and, and can take on um, impulses from the group. And I think Roger uh, highlighted this very well at the beginning when he spoke about uh, innovation. Uh, Chantal, Hannes, is there anything that I forgot and what you would like to mention? Perfect. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Andrea, sorry. So I might report to group one, Marius, if you let me. Is that okay with you? Sure, go ahead. So please chip in uh, when you feel like. So first of all, it's I'm very happy to see some familiar faces like Andrea. So, hey. Long time no see, so uh, it's it's always a, a very very nice to see a face, even if it's just virtual. I hope to ca to catch up sometime in person. And yeah, so on your um, leadership in recent months. Um, um, so basic background of there we were just two in the in the group. So Mario Superbuilder and myself. Uh, there were two others, but uh, you know I, I'm not sure whether technology didn't work, but there was just the two of us. Um, so Marius is in a, in a leadership uh, position in an in a, in a, in a equity brokerage firm. I myself, I work for the Crystal Company that some of you might know. And um, so the overall experience has been a little bit mixed uh, from the two of us. Um, I think uh, that um, Marius, uh, since he started in this partnership, he's been going through a crisis situation all over the place. And the thing that has changed now, uh, which is tricky, is with his clients. So not meeting clients physically and other stakeholders makes it uh, a bit more difficult uh, for the entire business and, and for himself. Um, for myself, it probably doesn't change much. I know most of the people in my environment um, and that that really hasn't changed. I, uh, you know, from, from, uh, in terms of productivity, uh, we also have a mixed uh, report. I think Mario sees uh, he's less productive. He feels like that. And I think I'm more productive because there's less uh, unproductive meetings. And when you have unproductive meetings, you know, there's plenty of to-dos on your side. You have the two screens and probably three, three laptops to work on. So, you know, I can do things on the side. Uh, I think for me, at least, I can only say it's been a lot more productive. Uh, leadership experience. Um, I think that the, the, the word that uh, uh, puts a parenthesis uh, uh, in, the, in the two uh, experiences of ours is trust. Um, uh, Marius, um, uh, I think he said empowering people um, um, is, is key. Um, sometimes you micromanage stuff. You think you have to do it yourself because you do it better and faster, but you have to put the trust in people and the, and, 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 and the process and accept, you know, what the outcome is. And in my case, um, I made an example of just today, we had, we, had, we had a meeting where we had both sides, the positive. Uh, so, you know, someone, like reading from basically a teleprompter on business performance, a business update in the first half and in the second half, uh, talking about real stuff, you know? So, you know, how you're feeling, what's your mood, what is the, the mood of the place? Uh, and, and that opened a, a totally different authentic space. And I think that the, the, the overall is, is, is trust. And that was because 
the situation was uh, a yeah, psychological safety I, I was called by some social sociologists and uh, and the like. Um, the, the third question, we didn't get successful leadership skill or rather luck, we didn't get to that one, no time. Marcus, hopefully I, I reported uh, more or less what we talked about. <laughs> well done, Nicola, thanks. <laughs> so any other group? Um, should I, guys, should I talk on behalf of our group five? Um, uh, uh, Adrian and Christoph, are you happy that I share some of our views? Absolutely happy. Okay. Uh, please just jump in if I've missed uh, any of the views. Um, yeah, we, we think that uh, last year's crisis presented a, a lot of opportunity for all of our respective businesses. Um, you know, we were forced to adapt. And I think um, the general sort of sense is that we adapted quite quickly. Um, uh, employees, you know, uh, Employee well-being was was particularly high on the on the priority list. Um, you know, providing them a safe environment to kind of like operate was 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 high on the priority list. I think generally speaking, there was quite a lot of success in the respective businesses that that we all uh, represented. Um, from a personal perspective, I can say that our business um, had something like 20, 30 percent growth on, on on the previous year, and that was largely a function of um, you know people just being a lot more productive, being at home. I think what we did was 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 we created an environment where um, they were able to basically achieve the work life balance that that they were looking for. Um, you know, going to the gym when they wanted to, looking after their respective families, but at the same time putting in the hours needed to to um, deliver on 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 the work that was uh, in their minds important. Um, we created sort of a culture of of of, of um, you know, purpose, and and I think that's that's to a large extent uh, what is what gave us um, the sort of productivity levels that that we had. Um, you know, one of the one of the one of the concerns though would be that for organisations that you know don't have very senior people working for them across the board, and and there are a lot more administrative type sort of personnel, it might be more difficult to implement strategies like this or to manage a business like this. You know, where you've got um, lower level staff where, you know, their sense of value, their sense of purpose is not quite as great as that of the owners of the business. I think it becomes more difficult to tag them along. And, um, you know, they're in it for the job as opposed to the vision or the purpose of, of, of wanting to be there. And, and I, I'm not so sure that that is a sustainable, um, you know, we, we, when, you, when you've got like lower level sort of folk working in the, in the organization. Um, in terms of whether or not it's, skill or lack and underestimate the role that lack might have. Um, you know, we, we made the point that it's almost a bit of a blend, uh, a combination of, of the two. Um, uh, and so, so, so both, both um, I think we're losing our audio, of course. Uh, can't. Um, there's a saying that we mentioned that um, was, was said by Scott is that the, Costa? the, the Costa. harder I try to. Costa? Uh, I hope Costa, we actually can't hear you very well. So, uh, we, we spent most time on catching up anyway. Yeah, let's yeah. um, shall we move on to the next uh, breakout session? So, Jenny, allow me, um, given, uh, given the time, uh, I think it's the moment where we have to have some agile leadership, I would suggest. And actually what I would propose instead of throwing everyone for a couple of minutes in another breakout and then no chance to debrief, why don't we just move to the, to the second set of questions and then throw it out in the open here with the group. And whoever hasn't yet said anything and wants to contribute uh, can still do that. And also going back to the first group and uh, first session and, and chip in, if you don't mind, because in five minutes we, we have to draw to an end anyway. You're okay? 
So actually, the, the, the second set of questions would have been um, how you describe your personal leadership style. Um, and I think that would be kind of interesting just to get one or two votes as well, you know, and, and statements in terms of has it changed over the years with special focus over the last 12, 15 months and why? Um, and then obviously we had before the positive leadership experience, now it's the contrary, the, the negative leadership experience. Uh, there a bit the question, what would you have advised? But let's focus on the first one. I would be very keen to get one or two uh, statements in terms of your personal leadership style and maybe also a bit critical what has worked and maybe what has been the learning that has worked less well. Well, Roger, I can uh, break the ice if you allow me to. I started a new job about two months ago, and I found that really interesting during the pandemic to actually start something new. Um, because if you've done that before and you relied on a set of measures or pro a program, you have your 100 days program that you've always done, that actually does not really work right now the same way it did before the pandemic. And it's interesting that there are certain things that actually simply can't, you can't do that. You can't just bring all your uh, team into one room and have one grand, uh, grandiose speech and tell everybody the same. You actually have to um, cut it into pieces and, and start talking to individuals. And most of them actually online. Uh, some of them, you don't even see them. You get a quick introduction and then you turn, turn the camera off or on and everybody a little bit individually. And that actually just uh, changes your leadership style quite dramatically. Um, so you can't rely on just your personality working, but you have to have a, a, a somewhat more structured approach. You have to, for instance, I took, uh, I, I do interviews with all, all, uh, all people working in the same area, which, which are over a hundred. So you, re you really have to spread out quite a bit. You know, you, you take half hour interviews with each and every one. And uh, each and every one tells you something different. So you can't even have a, a very strict agenda. So you have to completely release it. And then you, you get some really funny reactions. Uh, so some actually told me, well, I, I've never talked to your predecessor. Just on a one-on-one. -on -one. And you get pretty, pretty interesting feedback. But at the same time, you're inundated with, uh, with individual feedback. Uh, you have to put together like a puzzle. And it's really difficult to get the sense of what's really going on. And, and interestingly also after 12 months in the pandemic, I found out that the culture people are talking about is not the culture I see. They still think it's the same culture today as it was 12 years ago going into the pandemic, but it actually changed. Uh, new people came in, they have different sorts of communicating. So it's also, it's also it's not your own leadership style that has to adapt to the pandemic. It's interestingly also the organization and the culture adapts to the pandemic. Thanks, Oliver. I mean, I can maybe share what is different in, in the personal leadership style two, two, three years ago and now. I think it's in crisis time, it's... Um, there is a there is a need of higher frequent uh, higher frequency of information from your uh, you know from your cohort whatever it is, so you need to somewhat respond to that need and I think that could be a you know a substitute of you know lacking of proximity physical proximity, and it's it's no matter whether it's formal or informal information they just I think most people need, have the need to you know to hear. Um, to hear their, their, their bosses, especially in, in, in more frequent uh, rhythms than, than before. I think that is the, one of the, my major takeaways. Thank you. Actually, also think what is interesting during this phase, you know, is you really totally shift from, in some areas from an input, but now clearly to an output culture. You really focus just on the outputs because you don't need to know 
where your people sit, how long they work on something, is really about results. And that, that is uh, very encouraging. And, and also, you really see who thrives in such an environment. Yeah, thanks, Holmes. I guess the interesting part there would be, and, and I think having uh, one eye on the clock um, to summarize a bit, and interesting to pick on what you just said, Hans, I think there's on one hand, uh, looking just at the outcome and see what we've heard before, there are those who have increase in uh, productivity, growth significantly. The question ultimately is, and, and Nicola, you, you, I think you have mentioned that before a bit, is, is, is that authenticity and that that, that trust element. And uh, I think I would, I would also uh, go back to the, the summary and I've written up a bit what each of you has mentioned. And uh, it's interesting, it's about 80% is, is in the area of those, what we would have called prior to the pandemic, at least soft factors. And you still, at least in my work, I come across so many leadership teams where they still have a little of smirk for you if you come up with the soft factors because you have the hardcore KPIs and they are somehow in their mind unrelated to the soft factors. <laughs> and the interesting part, and I think that really puts me still uh, um, at, at a core passion for this is really the enablers to have that outcome that Hans has mentioned as well. And what you have mentioned before is actually, how do I make people feel comfortable? I think it's the frequency, Nicola, that you've mentioned. And, and I think FaceTime and Zoom and all this helps to have quickly touch base. But ultimately, they feel you differently as well, right? Because if you do the check-in and you share, and in the back of yours, one sees the, I'm not quite sure, I think it's the couch or something that, that one sees. So you share part of your personal life and it makes you approachable. And it allows me, let's say as a low level staff to actually engage with you on a personal level through the surrounding already. So the whole thing becomes personal and I would almost say more normal. And over the years, especially in the banking environment I was in, I was always wondering why do we make it so complicated? If we all would go a bit back and create the more normal environment, talk to each other, share what we're worried about, what we like, it's actually backstepping. And that's why I shared in when you were out in the breakout session with Penco, leadership 5.0 sounds like a progression, like more digital, or I don't know what. No, actually, it's going back to the basics, that, that fundamental of self-awareness, self-management. Each of us has to ask ourselves, do I have fun what I'm doing? Can I be myself in what I'm doing? And do I allow the other ones around me to be themselves? Because I, what I don't want to see is people walking out at five or six o'clock and become entrepreneur while at work. They never wait, uh, erase an idea. They never share their thoughts. And interestingly, outside work, they become the smartest, the greatest person. Why can't I transform some of that into my day-to-day -day work? So actually my takeaway listening to all of you uh, this evening or over lunch is the importance of exactly trust, flexibility, shared purpose, um, um, articulate the vision, feel valued, um, what, what others, um, structured approach and all this uh, productivity related topics, they, they for me confirm a bit uh, the notion that we really need to go a step back and bring in a bit of, of, of normality and a bit of care and interest for actually the, the people um, in the organization. So I, I try to naturally summarize a bit uh, what we have heard. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a topic that we somehow have to abort because the time is up and many of us have other things to do right after. So I'm very conscious of that. Um, from my side, a big thank you um for for your participation and interesting uh, uh votes and and comments um and i hand over to oliver jenny penko i don't know who but uh, thanks for having me and uh, a very good night and a good afternoon um, to all of you yeah we managed uh, to organize the beginning but not the end so uh, <laughs> thanks a lot roger for uh, taking the time, preparing it, and moderating it. Thanks a lot for your insights. Uh, it was a great pleasure to see you all. And uh, 
uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the evening and the rest of the day and hope to see you soon again in one of our physical or virtual events. And uh, if you don't know what to do and feel lonely, then just call any anyone you know, uh, either on the list or you connect uh, somehow differently uh, and make sure you stay connected with, with each other uh, personally. I'll call you it's great to see you. <laughs> Thank bye. you, everybody. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you very Good much. Good evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.